Where is Peng Shui? This question has been plaguing the media outside of the Great Firewall of China ever since the Olympian went missing after speaking up on her case of sexual assault. Today we sit down with Laura Harth, campaign director at Safeguard Defenders and human rights advocate, to discuss Peng's recent interview with foreign newspaper Le Keep. We talk about the merits of Peng's statements and how it might fall into a paradigm of forced confessions, an abusive tactic used by the CCP on sensitive political matters. We also talk about Safeguard's research with CCP's reach overseas and how people outside of China may be targeted by the CCP's co-opt operation, even if they're foreign citizens. This is Forbidden News, and I'm Gary Bai. Director Laura Hart, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So we're here to talk about Peng Shui. She's been quite the focal point on the topic of human rights long before the start of the Olympics, and it culminated last weekend. And just so to give our audience a quick abstract of what happened, uh, she alleged in a post last November that one of the most powerful men in the country under CCP rule had sexually assaulted her and had disappeared ever since. And uh, over the past weekend, she had her first official appearance to the Western world in an interview with Le Keep under the supervision of a Chinese official. So how would you gauge the situation here? Well, well first of all, obviously on Saturday, she did the interview with... Uh... Lekip, as you said, it was the same day that she then met um, Thomas Bach for dinner and another member of the IOC uh, executive committee. So we could see these kind of staged events following up on one another. Um, we've since seen her appear in public, uh, very much touted, obviously, by, by official Chinese state media, propaganda um, media, showing her off to the world, making sure she is um, seen. So how do we react to this? Well, again, um, the, the first thing obviously always to say it's very difficult in these cases because we as, as human rights defenders are people that try to protect human rights. We want to be very careful of the person involved, um, but we're also very certain that actually the international attention that we hope will continue on her case uh, is definitely providing her some additional uh, protection compared to what may otherwise have been the case. Obviously, we've seen her rebuttal once again, uh, repeated rebuttal of, you know, the accusations of enforced disappearance, of being forced to testify. Um, again, with full respect to the person, we do not find those very uh, credible, uh, both for the manner in which those, um, you know, comments uh, those rebuttals were were presented. She was not alone. Her um, the questions had to be submitted in advance. Um, the answers were also, you know, reviewed in advance. Uh, L'Equipe did not have a possibility actually to have a frank and, and open conversation with her. Um, so we see these kind of staged events, which um, you know make us pretty certain that she is not free, that she is not at liberty to to speak her mind. And I think some of the things that she said in the interview also point to it because it's quite unnatural for a person, uh, I would say, to only refer as when, when she's asked about her personal life, about her life over the past months, she also only refers to these perfectly staged moments that we have seen um, through the Chinese propaganda machine. Now, I think that's not natural. Um, and that's some of the things that we see coming back, obviously, which we've documented when it comes to these kind of forced confessions, forced, forced testimonies, the way they are scripted and staged. So also we can look at the way she was dressed up, the way she was asked uh, to pose and so on. So it's a bit unfortunate. I mean, I, I do understand that L'Equipe like, probably when they made the original request uh, had the best of intentions. We know that they had been paying attention uh, to her case. However, I think once they got, you know, um, the request from the Chinese uh, organizing committee on how this interview should be conducted, I think it would have been much better had they not participated in this propaganda effort. And the same obviously goes for the IOC, um, which I would say is just uh, by this time, uh, finds itself at a completely different scale of, of the blame it takes for, you know, her case, but the entire debacle of the, these um, Beijing Olympics. And I'm very grateful for the WTA to speak out, continue speaking up and saying that they are not buying into this. So there are a couple things that I wanted to pick up from what you said, uh, but something that I think should be addressed up front is what you said about forced 
confession, forced confession, uh, because this concept could be quite confusing to someone, say, who doesn't have a complete understanding of how the Chinese Communist Party works and how they handle issues they believe that are politically sensitive. And so could you give us a little background uh, on this forced confession and how it, how it works? I think the first thing to understand what is politically sensitive in the current People's Republic of China, and obviously it has been this way for, for a long time, the CCP is in power since over 70 years, but we've seen how since Xi Jinping came to power, the whole system of repression uh, has just gone up, the whole idea of what is politically sensitive, of what is being seen as corrupt, corrupt, which is much more than taking money, but corrupt, corrupting you know, the party spirit, corrupting the image of the CCP, of the PRC uh, abroad has just been amplified. And so increasingly, I mean, we just we see the official numbers going up, obviously, the, the few official numbers that the Chinese Communist Party or its, you know, various organs, bodies release are only most of the time only the tip of the iceberg. Since 2013, the year that Xi Jinping came to power, the number of enforced disappearances continued to rise. According to reports scripted and staged by Safeguard, the first high-profile case was about Liang Hong, a top executive for British pharmaceutical giant Glasgow SmithKline in China, who appeared on state broadcaster CCTV and confessed to bribery. Liang's confession was made before trial and even before formal arrest, violating both domestic law on the right to a fair trial and international human rights protections. Obviously, we also know very well how these kind of forced confessions work. We know what happens in these systems of enforced disappearance, the kind of pressure, mental and physical pressure, torture that is being exerted, the threats that are being made possibly also, you know, not only to the person themselves, but to family, relatives, loved ones, everything to make sure that a person will kind of comply with what the official message uh, needs to be. So there is nothing really new to this. There are some periods where there's more intensive uh, than others. But all this leads us to think that Peng Shui is, is, is most likely also subjected to these kind of measures. Um, again, her case, let's remember that the person that she uh, accused of sexual abuse is someone uh, very high up, as you had already said, um, someone that was very much involved in organizing these Beijing Olympics, someone that was very close in organizing these Beijing Olympics to, you know, uh, Thomas Bach, the chairman of the International Olympic Committee. So it kind of all ties together. Um, we also know how these Beijing Olympics are a crucial part of Beijing's efforts, of the CCP propaganda efforts to portray itself, you know, as a huge power in the world, as a hegemon. Um, obviously, and thank God, it's not exactly going as they planned. Um, and that's thanks to the efforts of so many, many people around the world, many of which have also been and continue to speak out about Peng Shui. Uh, so we must keep up those efforts. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the International Olympics Committee because it seems like they're always looming the picture here. Uh, so the president of the IOC, Thomas Bach, uh, he went to dinner with Peng Shui in the past weekend, but it seems like they, they didn't talk about anything that's too substantial from what was reported. Uh, you know, they talked about their past Olympic experiences, they talked about tennis. Uh, so how do you see IOC's part in this? Well, it's very unsurprising. I mean, this dinner uh, was the third instance where they supposedly freely met and, and had a free discussion with Peng Shui. There was obviously the first video conference of which we got some screenshots and, and you know, a press statement by the IOC. There was then a follow-up call where we had no pictures, but again, a statement by the IOC. Um, let's also remember all these instances when these happened, they briefly followed an instance where either the WTA or there had been like a huge international moment of attention on Peng Shui. So the IOC always came to the rescue of the CCP at the exact right moment, right? Um, obviously, what we also know from how L'Equipe got the interview is how they kind of set up these um, these occasions. This is not directly with Peng Shui. You know, there's middlemen actually, you know, saying we should do this, we should do this. And so we can also imagine that probably the IOC, Thomas Bach, was actually asked uh, to provide such instances. Uh, we will never know for sure. But ev most evidently, he was very happy to oblige. As I already said, it just 
adds to the huge complicity that the IOC has in this whole Beijing Olympics. I mean, Ping Shui should be an isolated case. Unfortunately, with the Olympics yet again happening in Beijing, it's just emblematic of so many cases uh, going on. We've seen allegations, the possibility that the, the Uyghur athlete that was, you know, called upon, uh, again, also taught it in, in propaganda during those days, called upon to... Um, light the, the Olympic torch has since kind of disappeared. She has not appeared in front of the media uh, when she was expected to after her competition. So we don't know what happened there. So we're kind of seeing these stories. We've been reading stories of athletes from other countries that, you know, are just talking about the horrible conditions in which they find themselves. Um, we've seen accusations, you know, complaints by, by coaches, by official other national teams. We've obviously seen what's been happening to journalists. And again, also in those instances, the IOC is always very quick to say, oh, it's an isolated incident or we are looking into it. Everybody's doing the best. They're always kind of, you know, um, towing the party line, as we say. And it's been very good, actually, to see, for example, also the journalist Shurten Das from NOS very quick, quickly reacting and saying, look, this is not an isolated incident. This is actually what is happening on a daily basis for reporters in China. Uh, this was all also exposed, you know, earlier this month by the Foreign Correspondents Club of China annual report. Um, so the fact that the IOC went ahead, organized these Olympics in a country where not only did we know from, 20, from 2008 what was most likely to happen, we also knew that the situation had only gotten worse. And we now have a regime which is not even trying to fake it, which is not even trying to portray, you know, a more friendly image, um, a regime which is telling everyone not to politicize the games. Again, this was a line that was put into the mouth of, of Peng Shui as well. Uh, and let me make a remark, an athlete who says that she knows nothing of politics, that she's not involved, does not, you know, kind of freely state this exact party line. That's a bit over and over again. Um, so a regime that says let's not politicize has used every single occasion to politicize these games. The IOC has not stopped them but has aided and abetted them in, um, in this effort. There's been amazing work by some researchers, for example, Andrea Worden from um, Synopsis, who've researched this, who've looked into the ties between Thomas Bach, the IOC, uh, the Chinese delegation over time. I invite everyone to, to have a look at this and evaluate it. And if you allow me just a couple more seconds, we actually filed a formal complaint to the Ethics Committee of the IOC a couple of weeks back over the Peng Shui case, alleging how they had repeatedly violated their own ethics code, their um, codes of procedure, and also put Peng Shui in additional danger, you know, by actually aiding the Chinese Communist Party in her disappearance, in you know forcing her to make these kind of testimonies. The only thing that happened is they had the audacity to simply reply, again violating their own codes of procedure, simply replying by referencing us to you know an article online published by by a respectable outlet, that was not the point, but so not even to come up with you know their own response or their own statement. Um, obviously, we will be following up on that because even, you know, it shows the arrogance of the IOC in just not wanting to deal with it and feeling like they're above the law and there's nobody that can hold them accountable. Yeah, so to me, this this just it goes to show the influence of, of the Chinese Communist Party, I guess the awkward, uh, the, the cowardice of the IOC as well. Uh, it's funny because this reminds me of something I saw online that says even if Peng Shui were to be sent abroad, she would still be speaking under duress because the CCP is, is everywhere. Now, that's obviously a speculation, but some would argue that that's not so far from the truth. Now, there's a report by Safeguard Defenders about Operation Fox Hunt that talks about this. It talks about involuntary return, uh, that the CCP is actually arresting and harassing people overseas with basically a no regard for, for sovereignty. So in the context of this, of this influence here, what can the West do to counteract this or, or at least protect their citizens uh, from this aggression? So, well, the first thing to highlight, and, and thank you for mentioning our reports on involuntary returns, which obviously 
highlights how what is happening inside China is no longer just happening inside China. Uh, we are increasingly seeing uh, how the CCP is successfully exporting its you know, regime of political terror, of fear around the world um, by threatening, menacing people all, all around the world by um, having them return to China for persecution or for disappearance, torture through, you know, Ill illegal means, including clandestine operations by police forces on the foreign soil, uh, according to their own data. Uh, again, probably only the tip of the iceberg. There's been 10,000 successful such operations in the past years. So we're talking huge numbers. They're taking place all, all over the world, including in, you know, what you call Western countries, but democracies um, everywhere. And so that's obviously something that, that needs attention, that needs to be stopped. Um, and and it, it goes again to the complicity of organizations such as the IOC, but also Interpol and uh, the European Parliament ju yesterday just published a study on the abuse of Interpol, of red notices, which is obviously one of the things that China is, um, is guilty of. Um, so what can we do? Our job as an NGO, obviously, is to kind of document these instances to make sure that, you know, public opinion is aware of them, that lawmakers are aware of them, that governments are aware of them, to try and unveil also the links. What are the cooperation mechanisms? What are the systems that, you know, uh, the People's Republic of China or other regimes, for that matter, used to kind of prey on the vulnerabilities of, of democracies? What are they doing to undermine those fundamental rights and freedoms across the globe and not just in their um, policy sphere? So that's that's our role. And we obviously always hope that, you know, lawmakers, journalists, as yourself, um, governments take this up and actively work to counter this and to ensure that the people um, at least uh, outside China are protected. And a third part, I think, is also looking at, you know, what leverage do we actually have over the CCP to make changes? Uh, we know their leverage has been growing. They've invested a lot over the past years on, on you know, cooperating collaboration mechanisms with UN institutions, with other international organizations, talking of Interpol, but also UNODC, uh, signing extradition treaties, judicial cooperation mechanisms, including with bodies, you know, through bodies in China that are accused of crimes against humanity. So obviously, another thing that needs to be done is take a great look at all these kind of treaties, bilateral cooperation mechanisms that are in place, that the PRC, the CCP is violating on a daily basis. This also goes for Hong Kong. Review them, suspend them, you know, make sure that we are not legitimizing everything that's going on in China by actively cooperating with them. Make sure that we are protecting people here and pressure China, hold them to account to actual, actually make changes and abide by, again, not the rules that we are setting for them, but by the very rules that they inscribed in their constitution, the international obligations they signed on to, and make sure they do that. And if they don't, call them out on it and, you know, stop um, negotiating new trade agreements and so on. I mean, there needs to be a price, there needs to be accountability. We're not saying stop the dialogue, but make sure that we are aware of our leverage. And obviously, as a last resort, um, but very important, an increasing number of, of democratic countries and, and regions have now adopted the Magnitsky sanctions um, regime for individual targeted human rights sanctions against those individuals that are you know, guilty of the most egregious uh, human rights abuses. We need to dare using them um, more more often, more frequently, and to dare target also those higher up officials that are guilty of human rights abuses every, every single day. Well, thanks to people like yourself, we wouldn't have to go through what Peng Shui have to go through, uh, at least outside of mainland China at the moment. So thank you for joining us today, Laura. Thank you very much.